One of the most common questions we get is this. Quantum entanglement is always being discussed, but the details of how these experiments are actually conducted in the lab are never clearly explained. How does this process really work? What techniques are used? The answer is actually simple. Since these topics are highly technical, most content creators either don't fully understand them or avoid going into details because they fear it won't attract enough viewers. But in this video, we're taking all the risks and diving deep into every detail. And we're not stopping there, we're raising the stakes. Let's conduct our own social experiment. We'll explain how quantum entanglement is created in a laboratory and what methods are used. And if you'd like, you can rate how well this video answers your questions by leaving a percentage in the comments. If you think it's nonsense, write 0%. If you feel like you kind of understood, write 50%. Two weeks after the video is published, we'll calculate the average score and share the results of our experiment. The 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to scientists who tested Bell's inequality, disproving Einstein and the EPR team's views. The scientific community has now firmly stated quantum systems cannot be explained using classical physics rules. So, which experiment opened the door to this groundbreaking discovery? The Delft experiment. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into one of the most important milestones on the road to the Nobel Prize, the most famous experiment on quantum entanglement. Conducted in 2015, the Delft experiment demonstrated quantum entanglement using solid-state systems and became one of the strongest Bell tests to disprove local realism. The experiment, carried out at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands, used the spin states of two electrons to generate entanglement. So, what exactly is the solid-state system mentioned here? In the Delft experiment, the solid-state system used was a special crystal structure containing defects known as nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond. Let's break this down further. Imagine you have a perfectly smooth and flawless diamond. Normally, diamonds consist purely of carbon atoms. However, sometimes tiny imperfections or foreign atoms appear in this structure. NV centers form when a carbon atom in the crystal is replaced by a nitrogen atom, creating a vacancy. These nitrogen vacancy centers have exceptional quantum mechanical properties. Because of this vacancy, we can isolate electrons, control their spins using laser and microwave pulses, and maintain stability for long periods, making them ideal for delicate quantum entanglement experiments. It's even claimed that the electrons inside these diamonds are so well isolated that they are not affected by Earth's magnetic field. Of course, that's not entirely true. To shield against magnetic noise, the experiment used superconducting magnets and mu metal shields. In the Delft experiment, quantum entanglement was created using nitrogen vacancy centers inside diamond. Now, if you were a diamond seller, nitrogen atoms inside diamonds would be a big problem because the most valuable diamonds are clear and flawless. But if you work in quantum mechanics, this flaw is actually a gift from nature. NV centers provide an ideal environment for isolating electrons and controlling their spin states. These electron spins can remain stable for long periods and can be manipulated using laser and microwave pulses. The size of this vacancy is about the size of a single atom. A single nitrogen atom inside a diamond is approximately 0.1 nanometers in size. That's millions of times smaller than the thickness of a human hair. Sounds unbelievable, right? But it is precisely this tiny imperfection that made one of the biggest tests in quantum mechanics possible. The Delft experiment used this microscopic defect provided by nature to prove that quantum entanglement is real. So, where can you find such a diamond? Nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds are rare in natural diamonds, but for quantum research, they are specially synthesized in laboratories. Surprisingly, you can even order these diamonds online. Where from? The answer is actually quite simple, China. To conduct this experiment and create quantum entanglement, scientists used the free electron spins inside the nitrogen vacancy centers we just discussed. But what exactly is an electron? Electrons are negatively charged subatomic particles that orbit the nucleus of an atom. And what is electron spin? Spin is defined as an intrinsic angular momentum of an electron. While it cannot be directly observed, its physical effects can be measured. But let's be honest, this definition doesn't mean much, even to science enthusiasts. A more intuitive way to understand spin is to think of a carbon atom forming chemical bonds, which depends on the pairing of electron spins. 
This explanation helps a little, but it still feels like something out of Alice in Wonderland. So, let's simplify it further. You can think of electron spin like the north and south poles of a magnet. When two electrons come together, their spin values can either pair up or repel each other. A simple example from everyday life. The magnets on your fridge stick because the spins of their electrons are aligned, making them magnetic. In a way, you can think of an electron spin as an invisible hand of a magnet. One of the most important effects of spin can be seen in the formation of a water molecule. Hydrogen and oxygen atoms form bonds through spin pairing, as dictated by the rules of quantum mechanics. Electrons can have spin up or spin down values, or they can even exist in a superposition of both. And this is exactly the mechanism used in the Delft experiment. Quantum entanglement was created using the spin states we just described. And now, we're approaching the critical stage of the experiment. At Delft University of Technology, two laboratories separated by exactly 1,300 meters were specially set up for this experiment. This distance was carefully chosen to ensure that no classical signal, even if traveling at the speed of light, could influence the measurement of the other electron. In other words, the measurement systems at Delft University were designed with extreme precision to detect signals within 1,300 meters, even at light speed. Each laboratory was equipped with diamond crystals containing nitrogen vacancy centers. However, to ensure true quantum entanglement, the electrons inside these NV centers had to be completely isolated from interactions with other atoms. To achieve this, the electrons were first set to a specific initial spin state using laser pulses and microwave fields. Next, they were placed in a vacuum environment to shield them from external influences, allowing them to remain in superposition. In the first stage of the experiment, microwave fields were used to prepare the electrons in an initial spin-up state. Then laser pulses were applied in both laboratories to place the electrons into a superposition state. At this point, their spin values were no longer simply up or down. Instead, they were now governed entirely by quantum randomness. Until a measurement was performed, neither electron had a definite spin value. But for the experiment to succeed, these electrons, prepared in separate laboratories 1,300 meters apart, had to become entangled. Even though they were physically separated, they had to be quantum mechanically linked. And this is where things get truly fascinating. In both Laboratory A and Laboratory B, laser pulses were fired at the electrons simultaneously, ensuring that they absorbed the same energy level at the same time. However, this process required incredible synchronization. The timing had to be so precise that the laser pulses in both laboratories had to occur at exactly the same moment. So, how was this achieved? To ensure perfect synchronization, both laser sources were connected to the same atomic clock. Atomic clocks are the most precise timekeeping devices in nature, with an accuracy so high that they do not drift even at the femtosecond scale. Thanks to this extreme precision, both electrons were exposed to laser pulses at exactly the same moment, ensuring the creation of quantum entanglement. If the laser pulses had been even slightly early or late in one of the laboratories, the electrons would have interacted at different times and entanglement would not have been achieved. Incredible, isn't it? As expected, when laser pulses altered the energy levels of the electrons, each electron simultaneously emitted a photon. And these photons were directly linked to the spin states of the electrons. In other words, the quantum information of the electrons was encoded into these photons. Now, it was time for the next astonishing step. The photons emitted from both laboratories were directed to a common location at Delft University. We can almost hear you saying, no way. Two photons, traveling at the speed of light, from two different laboratories, were sent to meet at a central point where they would interact. But why was this photon interaction necessary? Let's pause the experiment for a moment and explain. At least theoretically, one of the methods for creating quantum entanglement is to have simultaneously emitted photons interact. If the photons emitted from both electrons interact under the right conditions, spin entanglement is established. But this raises an important question. Wouldn't applying a laser pulse to an electron in superposition collapse its superposition state? Yes, it would if the laser pulse acted as a measurement or had high energy. However, in this experiment, the laser pulses were kept at extremely low energy and were not used for measurement. Because of this, 
the superposition state was preserved. Now back to the experiment. The most fascinating part begins. The photons from both laboratories were directed to a shared detector and beam splitter at Delft University via fiber optic cables. These fiber optic systems were specially designed to precisely control the speed and direction of the photons. In other words, the photons did not travel randomly, they were guided with precision, ensuring they arrived at the right place, at the right time, and at the right angle. As the photons traveled through the fiber optic cables, they eventually reached the beam splitter, a critical component that determined how the photons would interact. To better understand this, we can think of a beam splitter as a two-slit plate in everyday life. In the classical world, if you send two photons through a double-slit system a million times, they will have an equal probability of both passing through the same slit, an equal probability of passing through different slits. However, in the quantum world, things work differently. In the Delft experiment, the photons passing through the beam splitter formed a special interference pattern that would never be expected in the classical world, all because of quantum interference. The critical moment begins this interference pattern was the key to determining whether the electrons were truly entangled. The more trials you run, the closer you get to the expected probability distributions. However, both Bell's equations and the fundamental formulas of quantum mechanics tell us that entangled photons passing through such a double-slit system will not follow classical probability distributions. To put it simply, at the quantum level, some outcomes are completely forbidden. The paths the entangled photons take through the slits and the interference pattern they form are not random, they are mathematically predetermined. The goal of the Delft experiment was specifically designed to answer a critical question. Do the photons emitted by the electrons form an interference pattern that aligns with Bell's equations, or not? If these two photons were truly entangled, their passage through the slits should match only one of the four Bell states, and no other outcome should ever occur. This means that no matter how many times the experiment was repeated, the probability of the photons passing through the slits would not be 50-50 as in classical physics. If the results did not match the Bell states, that would mean one of two things. Entanglement was broken classical physics was at play instead of quantum mechanics. However, the experiment once again proved just how different the quantum world is from the classical world. Breaking it down further in thousands of trials, Photons corresponding to Bell state 1 always pass through different slits, while photons in Bell state 2 always pass through the same slit. And never, not once, did the probability follow a 50-50 classical distribution. If entanglement exists, the photon's path is not random. These transitions are dictated by quantum interference, creating a probability distribution that is fundamentally different from classical expectations. The measurements taken in the Delft experiment confirmed that the distribution of photon paths did not match the rules of classical physics. Instead, they formed an interference pattern that could only be explained by quantum mechanics. The final stage, measuring the electron spins once entanglement was confirmed, it was time for the final step. In laboratory A, the electron spin state, which was still in superposition, was measured. At the exact moment of measurement, the electron in lab A collapsed out of superposition, and its spin was recorded as down. And this is where the most incredible part happened. The mind-blowing discovery immediately after the measurement of the electron in laboratory A, the electron in laboratory B, 1.3 kilometers away, also collapsed out of superposition, and its spin was recorded as up. No matter how many times the experiment was repeated, the outcome never changed. To describe this in the most accurate way, the measurement values were always 100% correlated, purely by chance. The final thought this behavior of nature is truly mind-boggling, but just as impressive as the results was the design of the experiment itself. Science enthusiasts, you asked, and we did our best answer. We hope this video has answered some of your questions about how quantum entanglement is created in a laboratory setting. One last point we want to emphasize. We simplify the explanations to make them more accessible. If you'd like a deeper dive into the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics, we'll see you in future videos.
3 kilometre uzakta bulunan A laboratuvarındaki elektronun spin değerini ölçüyorlar. Ölçüm yapıldığı anda A laboratuvarındaki elektronun süper pozisyonu çöküyor ve spin değeri aşağı olarak kaydediliyor. Ve işin en anılmaz kısmı da tam olarak bu noktada yaşanıyor. A laboratuvarındaki elektronun ölçümünün ardından B laboratuvarındaki elektronun süper pozisyonu da çöktüğü ve spin değerinin yukarı olduğu görülüyor. Bu durum kaç kez tekrar edilirse edilsin sonuç hiç değişmiyor. Ölçüm değerlerinin tesadüfi olarak %100 koreli olduğu şeklinde ifade edersek biraz daha doğru söylemiş oluruz. Çünkü spin değerlerinin aşağı ve yukarı olması tesadüf olarak belirleniyor ama biri aşağı ise diğeri kesin yukarı, biri yukarı ise diğeri kesin aşağı olabiliyor. Gerçekten doğanın bu davranışı insan hakkını zorlayan türden. Ancak deneyin tasarımı da en az doğanın davranışı kadar etkileyici. Siz sordunuz, biz yanıtlamaya çalıştık. Umarız bu video kuantum dolanıklığın laboratuvar ortamında nasıl oluştuğuna dair aklınızdaki birkaç soruyu cevaplamıştır. Son olarak bir noktayı vurgulamak isteriz. Deneyi ve ölçümleri oldukça basitleştirerek anlattık. Daha derinlemesine videolar istiyorsanız bunu yorumlara yazabilirsiniz. Videonun başında belirttiğimiz gibi bu videoda anlatılanlar sizin kafanızdaki soruların yüzde kaçını yanıtladı. Bunu da yorumlara yazarsanız. E bu kadar elinizdeymişken kanalımıza da bir abone olursanız çok mutlu oluruz. Bir sonraki videomuzda görüşmek üzere. Hoşçakalınız efendim.